tonight we're returning to the book of Acts and in Acts chapter 20 uh, tonight, and we're looking forward to what Jeff has to bring uh, from God's word to us this evening. When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. He traveled through that area, speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived in Greece where he stayed three months. Because the Jews made a plot against him, and just as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Pyrrhus from Beria, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derbe, Timothy also, and Tychius and Trophimus from the province of Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us at Troas, but we sailed from Philippi after the feast of unleavened bread, and five days later joined the others at Troas, where we stayed seven days. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Eucharist, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. We went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. When he met us at Assos, We took him aboard and went to Mytilene. The next day we set sail from there and arrived off Chios. The day after that, we crossed over to Samos and on the following day arrived at Miletus. Paul had decided to set sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. As Mark and the group take their seats, can I encourage you to open your Bibles back up to Acts chapter 20? In our summer evening series, we've been thinking about Paul's missionary journey, and here we're coming towards our penultimate in this series. Damien's going to be finishing of the rest of chapter 20 next week, but Bibles open in front of us. Let's pray to God before we go any further. Father, it's good just to be still as we come to look at your word. Father, we thank you for everything that's taken place in the service this evening. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to sing to you, our God. And Father, we thank you for an opportunity now to hear from you, because this is your word we turn to. And as we think about these events that happened many years ago, Father, we're thankful that they have so much to teach us about ourselves, so much to teach us about our lives today, but Father, most importantly, so much to teach us about you. And so, Father, may you take away distractions, thoughts of what we're going to do when we go home or tomorrow or in the week that lies ahead, and Father, may this be a time whenever we focus upon you and your word, and to you be all the glory we pray. Amen. If I said the name Maddie Hinch to you seven days ago, I'm not sure how many people would have known that name. But after an incredible performance in goals for the British women's hockey team on Friday night, Maddie Hinch has become a household name. 
At one point on Friday evening, Maddie Hinch for PM was trending on Twitter. If you saw any of the women's hockey matches last week, isn't it funny how with the Olympics suddenly you get into these sports that you never would have imagined watching, and after watching them for 10 or 15 minutes, you suddenly become a real expert in what's going on. But anyway, if you saw any of the team matches last week, you can't have failed to have been struck by the unity within that team. I love the fact that every time after every match they were interviewed, they referred to a squad of 31, including the girls and the women who hadn't qualified to go on the Olympic team. There was real unity within that team. There was real belief within that team. There was a real vision that they were going to win all the eight matches and get the gold medal, and that is what they did. Now, from that team, there may be names we know more than others, but that team had one purpose, and they were united in it. Tonight, as we look at Acts chapter 20, we come to a passage which helps us think about what the church is, and more importantly, what the church should be. And so, this passage shows us four things. We see that the church should be a place of encouragement, Secondly, it should be a place of fellowship and unity. Thirdly, a place where those who are asleep are wakened. And fourthly and finally, it's a place that's all about the Word. So firstly then, it's a place of encouragement. Encouragement, said George Adams, is the oxygen of the soul. As we move in to chapter 20, Luke gives us details of Paul's next stage of his journey that's eventually going to take him to Jerusalem in chapter 21. We basically get a one to two sentence summary of events which would have taken him months and which would have meant many hundreds of miles of travel. In these verses, we see Paul gathering around the church and encouraging them. Paul encouraged the disciples in Ephesus, verse 1. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples and after encouraging them. Then he went on to the church in Macedonia, verse 2. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement. And at the end of our passage, we see the church in Troas being greatly comforted. And the word comforted means the same as encourage in verse 12. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. Paul is going out of his way in every respect to see the churches he has planted be comforted and encouraged. So often we can think of comforting as sitting down with someone with a cup of tea and a box of tissues, but that's not what Paul is talking about here. As he goes round these churches, he's inspiring them. He's wanting them to be courageous, to strengthen them, to, bold, to make them bold so that they will carry on doing what they have been called to do. He wants to encourage the churches, and he wants the churches to be places of encouragement. In Hebrews that we're going to be starting to think about in a few weeks' time, we're told in chapter 3, encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today. Paul was wanting to be an encourager, and so are we encouragers? What exactly does that mean? What exactly is encouragement? How can we be encouragers? I think whenever we think about encouragement, what we have to do is think about discouragement, and it's the opposite. Encouragement is positive. It's not simply not discouraging people. It's proactively building others up. And most of the time, that's three words, as Paul did in verse 2. But it's more than just a trite pat on the back or a word of affirmation. Encouragement is much broader and bigger than that because it includes admonishment, rebuke, correcting, reproving, instructing, explaining, sympathizing, or suggesting. It's much more than simply saying, hey, you did a great job today. Christian encouragement is something more than the fake smile that you put on in work whenever that customer approaches you and you say, 
hi, can I really help you today? Whenever we think about encouragement, we want to think about it a bit like a race. Maybe you've been out on marathon morning, standing at the side of the road, looking to see your friend or your colleague go running past you. If they're making great time, you want to encourage them, you want to drive them on. You shout, you're doing great, well done, keep going. If you see them going past and they're really having to work hard and they're struggling, you say, keep going, you can do it, you can do it, I believe in you. They maybe go past you and they fall to the ground. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to run and you're going to help them to get up. Or maybe they've headed off and they're on the wrong track. Well, you can redirect them and help them get back on track. In the Christian life, we're told that it is like running a race. And all of us need encouragement to keep on going, to fix our eyes on Christ, to throw off sin that entangles and to keep going. And to do that, we need to encourage one another. That's what Paul wanted to do. That's why he was going out. He was going to the places that he'd been and was wanting to encourage them and build them up. Someone once said, if you wish to be disappointed, look at others. If you wish to be disheartened, look at yourself. If you wish to be encouraged, look to Jesus. May our churches be places of encouragement. But then secondly, not only are there to be places of encouragement, but there are to be places of fellowship and unity. So often we may have the impression whenever we think of somebody from the New Testament like Paul, that here he was out on his own, doing his own thing, single-handedly converting the whole world. But Luke wants to make sure that we don't have a wrong picture. Because what we're doing is we're given a picture of the fact that Paul is traveling as part of a team. Look at verses 4 and 5. Sopater of Berea, Aristarchus and Secundus of Thessalonica, Gaius of Derbe, Timothy, Tychus, and Tromphus of Asia. And we also know too that Luke was part of this team as well. He's the one giving us the narrative of what's going on. Here we have this team of people. It's a group of people who are working with Paul. And these people meant so much to him. Several times in his letters, Paul refers back to these men as kinsmen, fellow prisoners, fellow evangelists. Paul is involved and deeply committed to being part of the team. But in giving us this list, Luke also wants to make us aware that the church is growing and the church is growing in all nations. Whenever we look at this list, we're given, a fact, we're given a picture of the fact that disciples are being grown from every background, every social situation, free men and slaves. Secundus was most likely a title, which meant second-ranking slave. They were from different cultures and different heritages, Jews and Gentiles, and yet there is unity within this group. And not only is there unity within this group, but there's unity within the churches that these men represent. Because if you think about it here, we have a list of pretty much every church that Paul has plundered and visited. As we read through this list, we get a glimpse of the team that is built, and we get a picture of the churches that these men are coming from. Because this list shows that these churches had a passion for mission and evangelism. Because these men who were with Paul were no doubt some of the best within their congregations. They were the leaders. They were the ones who were helping to drive that congregation forward. And yet those congregations had the vision and had the willingness to let those men go to help Paul to see the gospel advanced across this world. They were churches that were breeding mature disciples. They were churches that had the boldness and the strength 
to stand in the face of persecution, grief, difficulty, loss. They were churches that were willing to stay faithful to Christ no matter the cost. They were prepared to make the stand that they needed to for the gospel. Churches that were making sacrificial commitments. These churches were not perfect. Read any of Paul's letters and we know that. But what was it about these churches that meant they had real unity? What was it about these churches that meant they were willing to let these men go to see the gospel advanced? What was it about this group that there was real unity between them, considering they were coming from different countries, different nations, different backgrounds, different heritages? Well, you're going to have to wait to point four to find out. But then thirdly, the church is also supposed to be a place where people who who are asleep are awakened. I'm sure that it's not just me. Well, I hope it's not just me that it's happened to, because I'm sure that most preachers have had someone or maybe a few people fall asleep during the sermon before. I did in talking with a friend this week joke that this is probably going to be the sermon where everybody's afraid to fall asleep. But we have to admit that we've all been in those situations and it come, where it becomes incredibly difficult to fight tiredness. It's been a long day. It's very warm in the building. You think, I'll just close my eyes for a few seconds in the hope that it will help alleviate the tiredness. That doesn't work. It just makes you feel even tireder. And so you decide to shift about in your seat. Then the sweets get passed out. You hope that that's going to keep you awake. And then if you really get stuck, you decide to take out a pen and start making some notes. Or maybe I'm just giving too much about myself away here. (laughs) Per Eutychus. He was most likely just a young teenage boy. It was late at night. They're upstairs in the building. Eutychus drifts off to sleep. Maybe he'd even move to sit by the window to try and get a bit of a draft. But he drifts off to sleep and falls to his death. But the morning didn't last long because Paul went down and bent over him, taking him in his arms and said, do not be alarmed for life is in him. The church is meant to be a place where we speak to people who are asleep. Now, I'm not talking physically asleep, although if the person beside you does start to drift off, maybe we nudge in the ribs, it'll not be a bad thing. But you can sit in church with an awake body, but with a soul that is very much fast asleep. Do we pray that God will waken up people from their sinful slumber? Do we talk to to people about the gospel? Do we talk to people about Christ? Do we talk to people who are asleep? Do we pray that God will change lives so that people are awakened to who God is? Do we pray that God will bring his life into the lives of those who are asleep in their sin? Ephesians 5, 14 says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Can you imagine what it was like whenever Paul was used by God to bring that young man back to life? What joy, what celebration. But what does Jesus tell us? He speaks to us of the joy and celebration in heaven over one sinner who repents. What are we doing about the people who are asleep in their sin? But it's not just those who aren't followers of Christ. Because the worrying truth is that as Christians, we can also be drifting off to our spiritual state. Martin Luther told a parable or dream about how on one occasion the devil sat upon his throne, listening to his agents report on the progress they had made in opposing the truth of Christ 
and destroying the souls of men. One spirit said there was a company of Christians crossing the desert. I loosed the lions upon them, and soon the sands of the desert were strewn with their mangled corpuses. What of it? answered Satan. The lions destroyed their bodies, but their souls were saved. It's their souls I'm after. Another reported, there was a company of Christian pilgrims sailing through the sea on a vessel. I sent a great wind against the ship that drove the ship on the rocks, and every Christian aboard the ship was drowned. What of it? said Satan. Their bodies were drowned in the sea, but their souls were saved. It's their souls I'm after. The third came forward to give his report. And he said, for 10 years, I've been trying to cast a Christian into a deep sleep, and at last, I've succeeded. And with that, the corridors of hell rang with shouts of triumph. Are you asleep tonight? But then finally, and most importantly, and what the previous three points have all been about, we see that the church is to be a place that's all about the Word. Chapter 20 began by telling us that even having fled from riots, even having avoided a plot against his life, Paul has a purpose, and that is to preach and teach the gospel. Nothing was going to put him off because Paul knew it was all about the Bible. Paul knew it was the encouragement that the church needed. Paul knew that being taught the Bible would lead to unity, would lead to fellowship. Paul knew that being taught the Bible would lead people to want to go out and to be evangelists, would lead people to want to go out and speak to those asleep in their sin. This passage, so many of us look at and we think it's the story of Eutychus. This young boy that falls asleep and is raised to life again. So many of us look at this passage and say, that's why our ministers should stop after 10 or 15 minutes. But this passage, these verses are all about the importance of the Word, all about the importance of preaching, of teaching, all about the importance of the Bible. That's what Luke wants to do here. He's showing us that the foundation for the church is being built on the teaching of the gospel. We're being shown here that churches need to have these characteristics, and they'll have these characteristics if they are building themselves upon the Bible. It's all about the Bible, even the incident with Eutychus. Over in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, we read, I per persevered in demonstrating among you the marks of a true apostle, including signs, wonders, and miracles. What's happening here is that God is marking Paul out as an apostle. God is saying, you've seen what happened here? You've seen this young man be brought to life. Listen to what Paul is saying. He's teaching the truth. It's reality. God is testifying to the truth of what Paul is teaching to the churches. This incident, I'm sure for many of you, took you back to the Old Testament, to the incident of the widow of Zarephath's son. Back in 1 Kings 17, we're in the days of Elijah. Elijah is staying with the widow of Zarephath and her son, and then her son dies. Elijah gathers up her son. He cries out to God, and God brings the widow's son back to life. And in 1 Kings 17, verse 24, this is what the widow of Zarephath says. Then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. 
Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. As we watch God raise Eutychus from the dead, the response is to look at Paul and know that this is God's man, to know that the words from his mouth are God's words. God has testified to the truth that Paul is teaching. This is the word of God. I want you to imagine for a moment that we've all gathered together in this building this evening to hear this famous preacher who's coming to deliver a final message before he moves on and we'll possibly never hear him again. It's a warm night, the place is packed, and upstairs there's a young teenager sitting in the front row. Sleep overcomes him and he falls over the edge of the balcony. And as always in a church congregation, there's plenty of doctors here and they pronounce him dead on the scene. Now imagine that sad minister comes down into the congregation. He gathers the young lad up into his arms and through him, God raises that young man back to life. How would we respond? Surely we would be wanting to run over to the young man to ask him what happened, what does he know, what does he remember? We'd be wanting to go to that minister asking him, how did this happen? We'd be wanting to bring him to people that we knew that needed miracles in their life. But the focus of this passage is on the importance of preaching and teaching, talking about the word, sharing the word. After Eutychus has been raised to life again, they celebrated the supper. And then Paul spoke until daybreak. And only at daybreak did the people take the young man home. Paul knew that it was the message, the message, the message. Paul knew that it was the word of God that was most important. It was their encouragement, it was their strength, it was their comfort. Paul knew that everything had to be about the message. This message that was about God, of what God had done in the salvation of souls by sending his son as a substitute and satisfaction for sin. It was a word about sinfulness and yet the hope that Christ brings. It was a word about covenant promises it was a word about Jesus as Savior of sinners and Lord of glory. It was the good news. It was the gospel. It was about Jesus Christ and what he had done and will yet do for his people. Look back to the passage. Paul goes back upstairs. The congregation goes back upstairs. Eutychus goes back upstairs. They break bread and they listen to Paul teach for a few more hours. This amazing event has just happened and what do they do? It's all about going back to the Word. They're focused on the teaching of the Bible and nothing is going to distract them from that. It's not until daybreak that they take the young man home. They're all about the Word. What kind of church is it that Paul has plundered? It's a place that's committed to the Word, a place that's committed to discipleship, to growing leaders, to evangelism, to seeing Christians strengthened, given courage and boldness to stand. It's a place that's about unity and unity in the gospel, no matter the background. It's a place where people are prepared to make sacrifices, to give, to see the gospel advanced. It's a place that's committed to the teaching of the word. This passage is all about the word. And surely in Bloomfield tonight, that's a message we don't need to hear. Because we 
are so blessed by the fact we can say we stand on a history and heritage of God's Word being taught in this place. But we cannot be naive enough to assume that just because that's our history, that it will be our future. Given a look ahead to next Sunday night and look down at verses 29 and 30. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Be on your guard. We have to be all about the word. And so the question for each of us here this evening is, do we want to be part of a Bible teaching church? Do we want to be part of a place that's focused on evangelism, that's focused on seeing people who are sleeping wakened from their sin? Do we want to be part of a place that strives for unity, no matter background or heritage, because we're united in Christ? Do we want to be part of a place that expects each and every one of us to be growing as Christians? Do we want to be part of a place that says, this is God, this is what God's Word says, and this is how we are to live as a result? Do we want to be part of a church that has courage, boldness, and strength to stand in the face of a world that wants nothing to do with God and His Word? Do we want to be part of a place that's willing to make sacrifices to see the gospel advanced? Do we want to be part of a place that says we are wanting our men and women, young and old, to go across this world to see God's kingdom advanced? See, there's something wrong if we say we want to be part of a Bible teaching church, but we don't want the Bible to change any part of us. If we want to be part of a Bible teaching church, well, then we want to be striving for unity and fellowship. If we want to be a Bible teaching church, we want to be praying, we want to be seeing souls that are asleep in their sin awakened. We want to be a place that's all about the Word. We may never be Olympic gold medalists, but we can become something much greater. We can become the men and women God wants us to be. We can become the church God wants us to be. And that happens through the word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that your word points us to Christ and how we can be right with you. But Father, we thank you that it then tells us that we are to become Christ-like. It shows our sinfulness. It shows our feelings and points us to what we are to become. So Father, for each of us here this evening, may we understand more of your word and more of what it means in each of our lives. And we ask it in your name. Amen. And I to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.